let's imagine we have this odd shaped tube again. Now I've put the, uh, the larger end on the left and the smaller end on the right. But now let's imagine that we also have a change in height. So let's imagine that our tube here is at some height y1, measured from some arbitrary zero height. And the center of our tube over here is at some height y2, again measured from the same arbitrary height. We've got a cross-sectional area of A1 over here with a fluid velocity of V1 and a cross-sectional area of A2 with a velocity V2. And again, let's look at some time delta T so that this section over here uh, flows some distance. We'll call this delta X1, which is V1 delta T. This Volume here we know is then A1 V1 delta T. So delta V, whoops, sorry, not velocity, delta volume equals A1 V1 delta T. While the mass here will be the density times the volume, so the mass will be rho times delta V or rho A1 V1 delta T. While over here, how much of this flows out? Well, we'll have some uh, distance delta X2, which we know is V2 delta T. The volume will then be delta V will be A2 times V2 delta T. The mass coming out up here, delta M, will be rho delta V, which is rho A2 V2 delta T. Okay, so there's the mass, mass going in, delta M, rho A1 V1 delta T, mass coming out, rho A2 V2 delta T. If there is a change in height, we're going to have a change in potential energy. So what is the change in the potential energy? Delta U will be the final energy, U2 minus U1, which is um, we've got uh, rho delta V. Uh, that's, um, that's delta M times G times the final height, Y2 minus Y1. So that's the change in the potential energy. Do we have any forces acting on the fluid? Well, yes, we've got a pressure down here. Let's imagine the pressure down here pushing on the fluid is a pressure P1, while the pressure up here pushing on the fluid up here is a pressure P2. How much work is being done on the fluid? We've got a pressure here pushing on the fluid a distance x1. So the work being done here is the force f1. But what's the force? Remember, the pressure is the force per area. So the pressure is f over a1. So we'll call this uh, force 1. So f1 will be p1a1 times, that's the force, work is F delta X, so that's the force, times the distance, which is X1, which is V1 delta T. So that is the, uh, uh, the work being done down here, increasing the, the, uh, the energy of the fluid. Up here, we're doing work pushing the fluid out, so up here, the work, we'll call this W2, will be equal to, very similar to this, assume there's a pressure up here, P2, we've got P2 times A2, that is the force, F2, times, I'm kind of running out of room here, times X2, and X2 is V2 delta T. All right, so here's the work being done on the fluid down here, increasing the energy. This is the work that the fluid is doing as it's pushing out so think of this as pushing this fluid out of the way. So this is energy that is being lost from the fluid, if we think about the fluid within our section here. So putting the work and the energy together, let's see what we get. From our conservation of energy, or the work energy theorem, we have that the total work done is then going to be the change in the mechanical energy, which is the change in the potential plus the change in the kinetic, 
The total work done will be the positive work done down here, work done on the fluid, which will be P1, and I've changed the V times delta T times the area as delta V. And then up here, we have the work that the uh, fluid is doing as it pushes out through the end of the tube, minus P2 delta V, equals the change in the potential, which again, I've changed the, the V delta T times the area as uh, delta volume, rho delta V times G times the change in the height, Y2 minus Y1. And then the kinetic, we've got delta M here, one half times delta M or rho delta V times V2 squared minus V1 squared. In other words, one half delta M V2 squared, the final kinetic energy, minus one half delta m v1 squared, the initial kinetic energy of our fluid. Well, notice, what can we do at this point? We've got delta v's everywhere. We can ca cancel out the delta v's, divide off the delta v's. Let's bring all of the one subscript terms over to the left. So we'll have p1 and then plus rho g y1 and then plus one half rho v1 squared equals, and then on the other side we'll have P2 plus rho g y2 plus one half rho v2 squared. And what do we notice? We have exactly the same thing on the left and the right side. So what does that tell us? That as this fluid flows, P plus rho g y plus one half rho v squared must be a constant. And this result is called the Bernoulli's equation. And it shows us what happens as a fluid flows, the relationship between the pressure in the fluid, y, the height of the fluid, the, the, uh, the vertical height of the fluid, and the kinetic energy, or relating to the velocity of the fluid, that this is a constant. Great. What kind of, what kind of uh, results can we get from this? Let's take a look at some different situations. Let's imagine that we have some container with a wide opening that is filled with fluid. And then we put a little hole in the side of the container, down here near the bottom. What do we expect to happen? Well, the fluid is going to push out here, and we're going to end up with a stream of fluid coming out here, like that, coming out like that. Well, before we even go any further with this, let's take a look at that. Here I have a two-liter bottle with some water in it, and what I'm going to do is let's put a hole in it right here. Now, what I want you to notice is the water is shooting out of the, of the container and the level of the water up at the top here is going down, but very, very slowly, much slower than the water is exiting the, um, the two liter bottle. Now, you can see how rapidly the water is coming out by how far it is traveling horizontally. But one more thing I want us to notice, and that is, as the water level gets lower, which it is doing slowly, as the water level goes down, the water's velocity is going to decrease. And you can see that it's going to be going further. Uh, I, I mean, the distance traveled is, is not as far uh, as the water level goes down as it was initially. So it's not going to be going as far as it was, and it's going to go slower and slower, and we can see that decreasing. Now it's very obvious, you can see the water level here is going down very slowly. You can barely see it move, but over time, it is coming down, and you can see that the water exiting the hole is slowing down.
Okay, very good. Let's see if we can analyze this now, excuse me, using Bernoulli's equation. Let's imagine that the surface of our li liquid is some height y1, let's just measure it from the bottom of the container. The uh, uh, fluid that is coming out the hole, let's imagine, is at some height y2. The velocity of the fluid coming out of the hole, we'll call that v2. So what do we have? Well, comparing the fluid up here and the fluid down here from Bernoulli's equation, we have that up here, calling this, say, this is 0.1 up here, this is 0.2 down here. Uh, P1 plus rho g y1 plus 1 half rho v1 squared equals P2 plus rho g y2 plus 1 half rho v2 squared. Again, we're assuming incompressible fluid, so the density is constant. Now let's think about it. What's the pressure up here and the pressure down here? Well, the pressure in both cases will just be atmospheric pressure because neither, uh, neither one is being held in by a, a container wall or anything like that. The only pressure is acting from uh, the atmosphere. So P1 and P2 will both be atmospheric pressure. We can cancel both of those. Now what is V1? The velocity of the fluid up here. We know that the surface is coming down very slowly. From the continuity equation, we know that V1A1 must be equal to V2A2, where A2 is the little area of the hole and A1 is the great big area up here. So we know that V1A1 must equal V2A2, or V1 must be V2 times A2 over A1. Now, if A2 is very, very small compared to A1, we know that V1 is going to be very, very small compared to V2. Let's assume that the, the hole is small enough compared to the, uh, the, uh, the size of the entire container that we'll basically ignore that. So we'll ignore V1 relative to V2, and so 1 half rho V1 squared is going to be much, much smaller than 1 half rho V2 squared. So if the velocities are small, if V1 is much less than V2, then V1 squared will be much, much less than V2. So we'll basically ignore that term compared to this one. So what do we have? Let's bring this term over here and we'll have 1 half rho V2 squared is equal to rho g y1 minus y2, whoops, y1 minus, minus y2. y1 minus y2 is basically this distance here, from here to here. Let's call that some distance h. And then notice we have a density on both sides, we can divide off the density, and basically we can solve for v2. v2 will be equal to, multiply by 2, we have 2g, y1 minus y2 is whatever this distance is, h, and, whoops, square root. There we go. v2 is the square root of 2gh. You might remember that is the velocity of something that has fallen a distance h. If it starts out at rest, we allow it to fall a distance h, the velocity down here from conservation of energy, mgh equals one half mv squared, we get exactly that, v equals root 2gh. So what's going on is we can think of this as this water is coming out here with a velocity as if it had just fallen a complete distance h. Very, very interesting. Let's take a look at another application. Actually, sorry, before we move on, I forgot to mention that result is called Torricelli's Law. Okay, very good. Now let's take a look at another application.